Good afternoon, or oh, still good morning. And thank you for coming to join us for this lunchtime session. We uh, are very welcome to this space in the public library, a good place to have public conversations. We know that we are also welcome to this land by the nations of the Treaty 6 Confederacy, the Woodlands and Plain Cree, the Soto, the Nakota Sioux, and the Dene. They have welcomed those of us who were from European countries and later those who came from countries all over the continent. My name is Kate Quinn and I'm the chair of the Sexual Exploitation Working Group. We are a leadership group in Edmonton that brings together uh, opportunities to listen, to learn, especially about the impact of sexual exploitation, also known as prostitution, sex trafficking in our community. Uh, our backbone organization is REACH Edmonton, and thanks again to REACH. Uh, this is being webcast. We know that there are people uh, in our city watching right now who could not come to the library, as well as there are people in other parts of the country. The webcast will also be available on the Edmonton Sioux website uh, probably in about a month. We as a community have been trying to listen and learn especially to the stories of those who have been uh, sexually exploited, those who have been homeless in our communities, those who have been victims of rape and other forms of assault, and especially we've been trying to listen to the stories of intergenerational trauma within uh, the indigenous communities and the way that we as a country and as people have interacted. So some of our great uh, work is before us as we try to live new ways and new relationships in, as part of the truth and reconciliation commitment that we've made as a city and as a country. Some of what Dr. Krauss may talk about today may be triggering to some who have experienced trauma, and many of us are frontline workers. If any of us need any support, I just invite you to, uh, to go outside, and Metal from the Sexual Assault Center or other community supporters would follow you and just spend a quiet moment with you. We are in a really tight uh, time frame. Uh, we'll need to conclude uh, at 12.30 in this space. We're welcome to go continue uh, talking outside. There's coffee and cookies, uh, but the space has to be cleared for an, a next group, so I'll be really precise at 12.30. We're so pleased that Dr. Krauss um, has uh, agreed to drop down into Edmonton. She is uh, also going on to Vancouver and then to Ottawa before she returns to Germany. Uh, Dr. Krause, you can read her full writings, especially I ask, encourage you to check out this website. But she is first and foremost a trauma specialist who has listened to people from all walks of life, not only those who've been harmed through prostitution. But it was listening to the stories of prostitution and learning about the inherent violence that motivated her to invite other trauma therapist to uh, join with her and to write an appeal to the German government and then she then took that uh, larger and invited people and groups all over the world to join with her. She has spoken before the Senate in Paris, the French Senate, and last year at the United Nations Status of Women uh, consultations in New York. She has been in Canada before in Montreal and we're so pleased that she is in the West. I'd like to welcome Dr. Krauss. Um, so thank you, Kate, and thank you for inviting me here in Edmonton. So as you heard, I come from Germany, a country that traumatized the entire world during the Second World War. And here I am today to talk uh, to you about trauma <laughs> and concerning the handling of prostitution, Germany is not at all a role model. In fact, it's hell on earth. And nobody seems to care, especially not women in Germany. They don't raise their voice, they are shut up. So first of all, I was asking myself, was it a mistake to invite me here? An error? Have you been in a moment of inattention when you invited me? Um, when we talk about trauma, we have to understand 
the dynamic of trauma. And one of the dynamic is to keep silent, to shut up about what, uh, what has been done to someone. When we talk about trauma, we also have to think about how trauma and collective trauma affects our community. I will give you a couple of examples. Germany, under the Nazis, aggressed, deported, killed, put in concentration camps. And for the crimes, not the men, but the women, the German women, had to pay for it. When the liberating soldiers came into Germany, they raped massively the women, not only the Russian soldiers in Berlin, no, all over Germany. Women have been raped. And at home, they were often got beaten up by their husbands. They were not allowed to talk about it. They had to shut up and suppress their pain. This mental process to deny trauma and repress the pain has been well trained by the Germans and seems to have been passed from one generation to the other. If you don't overcome a trauma, it will be realized again. If you don't speak about the trauma, it will uh, appear as symptoms, said Jeanne already 100 years ago. So I'm, I'm asking myself if the silence towards prostitution has something to do with our history, the German history. Women have been raped. They had to shut up. Now their men rape and women shut up again. Secondly, we have a long history of patriarchy. To legitimize the domination and exploitation of women and children without feeling guilt, it is necessary to deny the harm. When you look through the history of psychotraumatology, it started actually with the denial of trauma. It's interesting. Sigmund Freud, who is the founder of the psychoanalysis, treated women called at that time hysterical women. He found out that they were all sexually abused in their childhood. When the men from the medical chamber from Vienna heard about that, they put uh, Freud on pressure and he had to change his thesis. So he developed the fantasy theory um, where he denied the reality and said that in fact all those women dreamt about it. It was their wish. So again, shut up. When Bolby and Einstein find out that the children with a disorganized attachment behavior experience neglect and or sexual violence, they were cut off funding. When the feminists in the 70s said that women who have experienced domestic violence have the same symptoms as the Vietnam soldiers, they were told that rape doesn't exist in a marriage. It's, it's, it's their duty. It's not a trauma. So again, shut up. Today, when we say that prostitution is violence and causes severe trauma, we get to hear, no, it's a choice. It's a sexual service. It's a job. So again, a deny of trauma and the order to shut up. And why all of this? All this to protect a taboo subject, male sexuality and its right to fulfillment without constraints or limits. Healing trauma means to put words on what has been hidden, to uncover lies. And this is what I did. I put words on the silence. If we want to re re reverse trauma, we have to trail the truth. So I'm not here by chance, but because I did everything possible to break this silence which is, in my opinion, a symptom of a society that has perpetrator introjections. I started with an appeal in my hometown, then I mobilized uh, all the Germans, I mean, the most famous Germans expert in traumatology to take position. I started a worldwide petition in six languages addressed to Angela Merkel to abolish prostitution. And this is also an, a very important message to you. 
don't keep silence. Raise your wo voice. It's worth. If we keep silent, we become part of the perpetrator system and we dishonor the victims. I will try now um, with my presentation to show how um, prostitution is seen on a point of uh, of the point of view of psychotraumatology. This is not my uh, personal point of view, but this is what the expert in, in trauma from Germany uh, see prostitution. So we have first two types of trauma. Um, trauma type one, it's suddenly unexpected, once only, a personal or interpersonal. And trauma type two, it's chron chronically and cumulative. It's political aggression or interpersonal from the close environment. Child abuse, neglect, domestic violence, and I put here also prostitution. The last ones, so, Trauma type two causes complex trauma. I, I will explain it what it is later on. When you, we look at the epidemiology of trauma, we find out that it depends on the type of trauma if you develop a PTSD or not. And you see here in, um, in red, that rape is the highest risk to develop a PTSD, much higher than coming back from the war. So first lesson to learn is you cannot split off so easy your head from your body. When we look at the prevalence of sexual violence, so the most heavy form of trauma, we must state that it is widely spread. So the report of uh, the World Health Organization from 2014 find out that 20% of the girls experience worldwide sexual violence, 5 to 10% of the boys. A national uh, research done in France in 2014 find out the same numbers. Uh, children are the most frequently uh, victims of sexual violence. There is a high rate of re-victimization. 70% of them will be again victim of sexual violence as adults. And the perpetrator comes from the close environment. So those who should care are aggressing. Those who should be trustful abuse. Well, this study has been done by Dr. Muriel Salmona, a psychiatrist from France, and she asked me to come to Paris last year to talk about the situation in Germany. And we found out that we have the same statistics. This is a research done by Schrödle and Müller in 2004. Uh, on a very high number of women aged between 16 and 25 uh, years old. So it was 10,264 women, it's a lot. And we find out that uh, sexual violence, 34% of the women uh, experience sexual, uh, sexual violence, large definition, and 13% uh, heavy sexual violence. So harm that causes complex trauma is a national problem all over the world. And it costs the society billions of euros. Van der Kolk, who is the leader of the trauma center in Brooklyn, Massachusetts, says, when soldiers come back from war, the newspapers are full of it. When women get the victim of domestic violence or rape, nobody cares. Muriel Salmona says, it, says that we still live in a culture of rape. So what about prostitution? 
Is prostitution violence or service? Uh, this is again uh, uh, this uh, research uh, done by Schrödle in Germany. On the left side you see the main study and on the right side women in prostitution. But there have been, this is only one study, but there are a lot, a huge number of research that, done that try to figure out if women in prostitution face violence. Um, well, when you see it, you know, it's nearly everything, 90% uh, uh, um, sexual har harassment, uh, physical violence, mental uh, violence, sexual uh, violence. Um, you should start to question yourself, you know, if you can say that it's a job as a, any other. Today the figures would be even worse, I would say 100% of everything, because we have uh, only five, but this was at the uh, time where 90% uh, of the women uh, in prostitution were Germans, uh, and today only 5% are Germans, and 95% come from abroad. So the condition got worse. Since the law of 2002 that made out of prostitution a job like another in Germany, you see growing perversion among sex buyers. Practices are becoming, are becoming more dangerous with an increase in violence against women and a lack of protection of them. There is a menu circulating on the internet where buyers can choose what they want from a long a la carte list. I will just uh, cite a couple of them. AF, tongue, anal. AFF, anal fist fucking. AO, everything without rubber. Brown weiss, play with shit and sperma. DP, sex with two women or double penetration. EL, licking the balls. FFT, fist fuck totally. FP, blowing without rubber. FT, blowing without condom and with swallowing the sperma. GB, ejaculating in the face. GS, group sex. Caviar passive, men shits on women. SV, one woman between two men. Tabulos, without any taboo, everything is allowed. Z, A, lick the anus. So when we read this, I don't need another study to analyze if prostitution is a service or not. Licking the anus of a stranger is not a job. We have to stop the deny. So the question is, how can a woman stand this? This is what uh, Michaela Huber, who is the president of the Society of uh, Trauma and Dissociation, Dissociation, says. To allow strangers to penetrate one's body, it is necessary to extinguish some natural phenomena. Fear, shame, disgust, strangeness, contempt, and self-blame. In their place, there's women put indifference, neutrality, a functional conception of penetration, a reinterpretation of this act as a job or a service. Most of the women in prostitution have learned through sexual violence or neglect in their childhood to switch off themselves. So what does it mean to switch off? When we look at the precondition to enter into prostitution, we must realize that the majority of women have experienced severe forms of violence in their childhood. These are just three studies, but you can find much more. The first one is well known from Melissa Farley in 2003. I just put the physical uh, violence in, 
in red and the sexual violence in blue. And the two others, the second is the study of Schrödle from 2004 and another study also from Germany in 2001. So you see that sexual violence and physical violence is very high. So what does trauma with a person? This is a sentence I remembered a couple of years ago when this woman uh, survivor from 9-11 was invited at the German TV. I needed 10 years to understand that I was a survivor, not a victim anymore. Well, she survived, she went home and she probably washed herself. She got rid of the dust on her skin. But there was something in her brain that she couldn't get rid of anymore. For 10 years, you know, she, she developed a post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, she got drug addicted, she couldn't work anymore. And um, I was looking a couple of days ago, uh, I remembered her picture, you know, and, uh, and I wanted a picture of her, and then I found out that she died two years ago from cancer. Um, and she said, uh, yeah, this is the, tra the trauma did that to me also. It changed, changed something in my body. So studies have shown that PTSDs are very current along women in prostitution. Here again, two studies, one from Farley and the second one from Zumbeck. Farley has realized uh, that 68% have a PTSD, a severe form of PTSD, and Zumbeck in Germany, 2001, you know, when 90% of the women were German, 60% had a severe form of PTSD. So trauma is an injury that affects the brain, the body, the behavior, and the psyche but everything can be re, uh, recovered. This is important for me to say. You don't have to be, stay stuck in it. I want to introduce you now in the neurobiology of trauma, because it is important to understand this, and for those who work with traumatized people, psychoeducation is very important. People need to know what is happening with themselves. So I do this very early, you know, when people come to me in my uh, counseling, I explain this, what I will explain, you know. So here are uh, the parts of the brain who are involved in trauma. The prefrontal cortex. Uh, yeah, it's in German. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so here, yeah, this is the uh, prefrontal uh, cortex. Uh, the old brain. Uh, it's in grey. It's clear. And the limbic system in the middle, with the amygdala in red, and the hippocampus in green. Uh, the prefrontal cortex has the capacity to be, so the prefrontal cortex here, has the capacity to be in a situation. Yeah? I'm here, you know, I know what time it is, uh, what day, uh, where I am, to try to make decisions, remember the past, react and also to calm down. These are very important functions. This is the prefrontal cortex who is doing this. The old brain has the primitive functions. It's our autonomic nervous system that will activate our organs to keep us alive. It will make our, make our heart breathe, uh, beating faster, breathing faster, and so on and so on. 
And the amygdala, the red, is our alarm system. It has two functions. It is constantly scanning if we are in danger or if somebody wants to kill us. It will produce hormones that will put us in a situation that will, well, if there is danger, it will produce hormones that will put us in a situation that we will be able to survive. It's the fight and flight reaction. But it also has a second function. It also has a memory. So because we need to remember what is dangerous for us, what, wants to kill, what wanted to kill us. The hippocampus is the memory maker. So when information comes, uh, comes in, it will organize this information, put it into groups and store it in our brain. And those two uh, things will be disorganized by trauma. So if someone is under heavy distress, the amygdala fires off and sends messages to glands in our body that produce hormones to put us in a situation so that we can fight, flight, or freeze. There are four hormones that are involved in that. The adrenaline, that puts our body in a condition so that we are able to fight back, to keep us alive. Fear, anger, aggressivity, and cortisol, that gives us the energy in order to execute the fight and flight reaction. But when you fight, uh, you have a better survival uh, condition if you don't feel pain. So there are two hormones that will reduce uh, pain in our body. These are opioids, these are na natural morphines who prevent us from pain, but they block also all kinds of emotions. So sometimes it can happen that a woman who gets raped or who is in prostitution and talks about her, what is happening to her, she will do it without any emotions, you know? Like, uh, yes, you know, and uh, uh, he pu uh, put his uh, knife uh, on me and uh, he wanted to kill me, like this. This is very confusing and uh, and this is important for the police and the lawyers also to know about this, because very often they don't, uh, uh, you know, the thing is a lie. And oxytocin, um, that promotes good feelings. So, you know, you, you, you can uh, uh, block the pain in order to have no emotions or to make good feelings stronger. The body gets in a condition that we feel good. People will then describe trauma by smiling. And this is what you see very often. You know? uh, so in prostitution, they feel pain and they smile. This can be even more confusing. You know? and can uh, perhaps also explain the high rate of re-victimization. Because they feel good in that moment. So, vic yeah, this is perhaps... Uh, um, uh, Marilyn Monroe, for example, she, uh, she had a complex PTSD. And she, she, one of her famous sentences was, uh, I hate being uh, a sexual object. I am a sexual ob object. You know? And she smiled all the time. She had fears all the t always. And when she was asked once, well, when do you have, did you have once in your life no fears? 
Yes, when I sang in front of 30,000 soldiers. Do you understand? It's the oxytocin. So victims of trauma will have a mi mixture of combination of those hormones. It can go up and down and up and down. Then it will be high, and when they go home, they will be in depression and high again. Um, but when you are in danger and you cannot flee, the hormone concentration makes us freeze. The prefrontal cortex gets flooded by hormones, and we cannot make any decision anymore. So you know what is happening, you know what is happening, but you cannot stop it. You dissociate. This is dissociation. Here you can see um, the two reactions and uh, what it is doing with us. So the fight and flight reaction, it's clear, you know, your heart getting beating faster, you get a higher blood pressure, you breathe faster, you're starting sweating, muscle tension gets higher, the body gets energy in the blood, pain tolerance, tolerance gets higher, it, and so on, what I explained. And dissociation, you know, uh, your awareness and the memory are affected, like you feel like being in trance, body feeling is affected, like standing by side, like looking the scene from far away, like you're not in your body. The perception of the en environment is affected, like looking through a tunnel, or everything is foggy. The identity is also affected, playing a role, being confused about the own identity, getting multiple. The phenomenon of dissociation isn't something that you can turn on and off. You know, you cannot say, okay, I'm going to the brothel and I will dissociate and then I go home and I'm not dissociate anymore. It doesn't work like this. The dissociation can remain. There are integrative functions that can be, that can be extinguished for extended periods of time. For me, it's every time impressive um, to see uh, women uh, reconnected to life uh, when they are doing a successful therapy. Some of them say, then, now I can feel pain again. Because before, I just saw a blue thing on my arm and uh, didn't know how it came. Then. Or I can smell now and uh, food has taste before no, I had no taste. Or now I understand who I am. I didn't know who I was. But if it uh, were just a phenomenon of dissociation, the damages from prostitution would be limited at that level. But uh, there is also the traumatic memory. During dissociation, the body and the cortex are largely anesthetized. One perceives things, but they aren't, aren't all remembered in the cortex. This is very important. Because the hippocampus, but, uh, you know, the, this green part of the brain, is not working correctly during trauma. The information and the contextualization of the happening will not be stored correctly. So victims of trauma cannot always be able to say, this happened to me at that time and at that place, and I felt this like this. No. There can be amnesias to holes in the memory. Parts of the experience is recorded in another part of the brain, which we call traumatic memory. I will show you two pictures of a couple who were in the same car. 
and uh, who had a severe car accident. They were put in, the, in a computer tomograph and somebody read the story of the accident. The man, this is uh, the picture of the reaction of the man. He reacts with fight and flight. So it's interesting because the left side of the brain, uh, where he, you can speak, is not so much activated. Also, a part of the prefrontal cortex is not activated, but the om emotional part on the right side, and also the amygdala, the amygdala you see it, uh, is highly activated. And look how uh, his, uh, his wife reacts. She dissociates. So, in actual fact, this experience was done by Van der Kork, and uh, he couldn't understand uh, the difference between men and women. No. He, he talked to the woman, and uh, he asked her, what, how come? Well, in fact, uh, she experienced, uh, experienced um, neglect in her childhood. Um, so she learned very early to switch off. And this is what Michaela Huber said. The women learned very early to switch off. No. Well, uh, well, this doesn't help her, you know, in a situation of danger. So that's why also the re-victimization is so high by uh, people uh, who have been uh, victims of sexual uh, violence or neglect in their childhood uh, because uh, they don't learn to protect themselves. They cannot uh, defend themselves. Just a couple of words about the traumatic memory. This memory doesn't function under the same principle as our cortex. Well, if I ask you now, what did you do last summer? You know, you will somehow go in the store of your cortex, you know, and you will be able to tell me what you did. Uh, the traumatic memory is a kind of a black box Uh, to which we don't have conscious, conscious access. We don't know uh, that it even exists. This memory collects traumatic experiences in order, in a disorderly way, without a sense of space and time. It isn't semantic. It has, doesn't have a language. It can be brought on at any moment by trigger events that revive the trauma. A smell, a color, a sound, images, words, phrases, and so on. At that moment, it triggers an intense anxiety, as if the person was re reliving the trauma at that very instant. So the um, hippocampus will not be able to say, hey, no, uh, this is not happening now. This happened, you know, uh, 10 years ago, uh, at the 9th of September 2001. No, it's now. And this is called um, flashback. These are reaction known as post-traumatic stress disorder. So in other words, it's like having a time bomb in their head. Well, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I, uh, I have a new patient. So I have uh, lots uh, of uh, severe traumatized uh, patients, but it was interesting because this woman was uh, uh, sexually abused by her father, and she's now 55 years old. And, uh, you know, she got along with her, with her life, and suddenly absolutely nothing uh, 
uh, functioned anymore because uh, she got a letter of her mother. Puff, you know, for 40 years it was okay and suddenly the bomb explodes. So here I have listed the symptoms of a PTSD, just that you understand trauma is a fear reaction. The body continues to feel as if the trauma happens all the time and again and again and again. The brain is being damaged and makes us think that the danger is still there, that it, it is not gone. At the moment, I have many uh, women uh, in, in my uh, counseling office who are refugees. And now, you know, they're secure in Germany, but they're afraid all the time. They're afraid to go out, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, they're afraid to take a, a bus. They're afraid uh, to talk to people. They're afraid it's, uh, they live in constant fear because they're, think uh, that the trauma will is still not past. So this a reaction of a simple PTSD, a person who has been victim of a trauma type one, like the victim of 9-11. What happens now if somebody is repeatedly excused exposed to traumatic abuse and is getting hurt by people who should care, who can imagine, as, you, know, you can imagine that our alarm system is then totally dysregulated and our capacity to calm us down, prefrontal cortex, and to feel safe, has not been developed. Victims of interpersonal and chronically abused are under constant distress. There was no safe place, no person for them. They don't know what that means. Those children develop also a sense of self in this environment. Those who should help hurt. So the self is marinated in abandonment, deception, blame, humiliation, and isolation. The children develop a deep sense of shame because they think that it's their fault that this happened. Those people, when they become Adults fulfill many diagnoses. Well, this uh, are many studies, you know, done um, to see uh, uh, what other diagnoses people have with a PTSD, and you can see that the comorbidity is very high with PTSD, like alcohol addictions, uh, drug problems, depression, borderline personality, chronically um, psychomatic pains, fears, dissociation disorder, eating, it's, and so on. Here I have listed again all possible mental disorders when you are victims, repeatedly victims of uh, sexual violence. But perhaps they have only one d diagnosis, complex trauma. For more than 30 years, the experts in trauma, experts in trauma want to have this new diagnosis to be accepted in the classification system. It was refused in 94 when the DSM, DSM-4 came out and again refused 2013 when the DSM-5 came out. Van der Kolk says that we have an insane diagnostic system that ignores people's life. It is just classifying people into categories 
by describing symptoms but does not identify from what people really suffer. So again, keep silent. It's a return to the 19th century. So what is complex trauma? One, people with complex trauma have difficulties to regulate their emotions and impulses. You know, prefrontal cortex. They tend to overreact to stress. They have difficulties to calm themselves down because they didn't learn it. They become self-destructive because external pain is easier to support than inside pain. They develop eating disorders, self-injury, addiction, and I say also prostitution is a self-destructive behavior. Two, they often have dissociative dis symptoms. The information and experience are not narrative. They cannot talk about what happened to them. Because the memory isn't integrated, it continues to impact their life, but, they cannot, uh, but it cannot be spoken. There are no files in the brain of those persons where they can say what happened to them. The memory is fragmented. The only way to get away if you cannot flee physically, it's to go away with your mind. You dissociate. They haven't pr uh, learned to protect themselves, to defend themselves. Three, the way they perceive themselves gets, get destroyed. They have perpetrator interjections. They think that they are unlovable, incapable, undesirable. Victims blame themselves and believe that nobody will understand. They carry a great sense of shame, not just about what it was done to them, but they're thinking that it was done to them because of who they are. Four, changes in the perception of the perpetrator. They think constantly at the perpetrator. They feel controlled by him, even if he's not there anymore. They will take the per perpetrator's view of themselves. They attribute to total power to the abuser. They get bound to the to the to their perpetrator because bonding is necessary for a child to grow up. Five, they have no model in their mind how a healthy relationship looks like. You can do what you have never seen. So very often they get the diagnosis of a personality disorder called borderline. Six, Chronic trauma affects also the body, so they suffer very often of somatization. So in therapy, we give them skills to manage themselves. We put words on what was hidden. We uncover lies. We cry. We show them that a different kind of a relationship is possible. The dynamic of trauma is you have no choice and stay silent. Understanding what's happening and has been done to oneself opens a door and let one say, I have the choice. Thank you. They're still not getting any adequate training in the neurobiology of trauma. And this is where a lot of um, survivors of trauma or people that are trying to recover from trauma end up in psychiatrist offices. And if psychiatrists can't recognize what's going on with them, they never get the treatment they need. 
Mm-hmm. So I just want, I don't know if you have any ideas or experience in advocating for this, you know, this kind of training to be just standard part of of psychiatric training. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Uh, the question was if uh, I. I Yeah, I understood. Canada, yeah. There is a need for you to bring this forward in psychiatric training. Maybe you could share what you're doing in Germany. Uh, what I'm doing in Germany. That would, that yeah. Well, you know, uh, in fact, uh, when I was invited uh, last year to the Commission of Status of Women in New York, uh, I was a little bit surprised because uh, what we learned in Germany, it all came from the States. You know, you are 20 years uh, in front of us. And uh, I was uh, a little bit confused. But w- what we uh, managed to do in Germany, we have many, many schools of uh, psychotraumatology in nearly every uh, town. So we advocate. Um, so. Many psychiatrists and uh, counselor psychologists get a good uh, uh, training uh, in that. So I hope that uh, you will also realize this uh, here in Canada. And this, this is, I think, uh, uh, the difference. We train people in Germany very well. And to become a, a psychotraumatologist, you need, it's a three years of, of training. It's not only, you know, three days. No, no, uh, so, you know, you have to be or a psychologist or a psychiatrist plus three years. Also, the psychiatrists in Germany, they don't know about this. They need this further training. One thing I could perhaps add, and I'm not the expert in this in Edmonton, but I think that we are trying to uh, broaden this knowledge in the community. There is a a network called Trauma Informed Edmonton. And again, Reach Edmonton and others in the community are educating all of us. So hopefully that will affect our psychiatric training here. There's a question at the back. Um, So Lisa will bring the microphone. And if needed, I'll repeat. Um, so can a person that suffered trauma start their healing journey and, and be on this healing journey and think that they're living a normal, productive life, um, knowing that they still have kind of like a lifetime of healing? And then that time bomb goes off. And what are the, what, what are the reactions when that happens? When what goes off? The, the that time bomb you talked uh, about. When the time bombs. Uh, uh, like you think you, you're yeah, okay. We train, well, the, f- the first is, you know, you ha- people, are, women have to understand how it works. So the, the understanding of neurobiology is very important. I, as I said, I do it straight uh, in the beginning. Because they don't know themselves what is happening, you know. They have an intense fear, and they feel it's uh, you know they are in danger, but they are not in danger. We uh, first of all we identify the triggers, so that they know this is a trigger, but it's not real danger. But this can, you know, make the time bomb you know explode again, and they get uh, skills in their hand that if this happens, you know well, how they can reduce the fear. So training. I read one of your articles, um, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more on the myth between choice and prostitution, and how women actually uh, manage to make their way through it. So the relationship uh, between uh, choice uh, uh, and to go into prostitution, yeah. Well, uh, as I uh, said, um, when you grow up in this kind of uh, environment, you know, you don't have uh, a picture of what is a healthy relationship. I can give you an example. Uh, 
I, uh, I have a woman who uh, still is in counseling uh, uh, with me, and uh, she had uh, lived through eight years of domestic violence, uh, have severe domestic violence. Yeah. And she got out, you know, with her children. Now she's stable, and she said, "Well, now I would like." to have uh, a relationship again, of course, you know, and uh, I put uh, in the newspaper an article and she said, uh, I put this in the article, in the announcement. I'm looking, uh, f I'm pretty, good looking, and I'm looking for a man for sex. Uh, I was asking her, say, well, you know, you could have written something else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that you want uh, somebody who loves you, respects you, and she looks at me and she starts crying, you know, uh, because she, she said, I don't know what it is, I've never lived this before. So it's a model they have in, you know, their mind. And uh, in, they know this model. You know, they know how to deal in these uh, situations. The, this other way is strange, and uh, you know, they still don't know if it really exists. Mm. I don't know if I can. Uh, uh, I I have uh, responded to your question. <laughs> we have time for one quick question and one quick response. Um, uh, the city of Edmonton um, licenses uh, women to work in body rubs and also as escorts as a harm reduction model. Would you say it reduces the harm to women to be licensed and working um, with some oversight from uh, the city? So, uh, uh, the, you, if I understood you rightly, that the uh, escort... Uh, Women uh, is a harm reduction. Okay. Do you know um, we only have one minute left? No, no. But uh, uh, well, this is what I, I try to uh, say with my appeal of the psychotraumatologist in Germany. There is no good uh, prostitution. You know. Yeah. There's not. Uh, you know. Uh, You cannot say that uh, escorting uh, is okay, but uh, street prostitution is not. No, all kinds of prostitution is violence. Because in the end, what is prostitution? Okay, you know, I, I read this uh, menu. But, you know, in the end, you are naked, naked, and a man is doing whatever he wants with you. This is prostitution. But this, you know, this is violence. Yeah? A man comes and says, this is what I want. And do it. Yeah. Now, this is prostitution. So forget all this glamour and, uh, you know, it's a form of prostitution. Who is, uh, no, all kinds of prostitution is violence. I think we, that concludes our uh, one hour with uh, Dr. Ingeborg Krauss and a strong conclusion it is. Thank you all for coming and thanks to those of you who joined by webcast. <laughs>